Welcome to Portsmouth Insights. I'm your host, Rob Lauer. The building behind me is one of Portsmouth's eight fire stations. Now, fire departments have been around for centuries for the very fact that fires always pose a threat to human life and property. On today's show, we're going to visit a company here in Portsmouth that works in restoring property that's been destroyed or damaged by fire, flood, or extreme weather. That company is Sir Pro Portsmouth. Then we'll sit down with Portsmouth's new fire chief, Beck B. Barfield III. And finally, we'll take a look back at life in one of Portsmouth's neighborhoods that was originally built during World War II to provide housing for shipyard workers in the military. A neighborhood that overlooks Portsmouth City Park and is home to Portsmouth's newest school, Simonsdale. So, join us for this episode of Portsmouth Insights. Welcome to Portsmouth Insights. Those of us living here in Hampton Roads are familiar with extreme weather, tropical storms, hurricanes, flooding, and homeowners especially know that the damage these things can do to their homes. Well, if your home is damaged by any of these, this is where you want to go. ServPro Portsmouth. I'm joined by Jim Toops, who is the owner of ServPro Portsmouth. Jim, thanks for joining us today on Portsmouth Insights. Thanks for having me. So I understand, okay, we live in an area that gets a lot of weird weather, tropical storms, hurricane warnings. So if I have damage from flooding, weather, smoke, fire, you're the fellow I want to come see, right? 24-7, 365 days a year. Yes, we can help with that. Okay, so what, what services do you offer? Um, we do a lot of uh, water mitigation, which would be like if a hot water heater broke or um, air conditioning lines back up, mm -hmm. and a lot of times those are up in the attic. Uh, all of a sudden people have water where it doesn't belong. I, I meet a lot of very nice people in strange <laughs> ways that way. <laughs> and I'm sure they're happy to meet you. Um, <laughs> when we show up, yes, very okay. much. So um, now, what... Um, what types of uh, services do you offer as far as like fire damage, smoke, that sort of thing? Um, we get called pretty much whenever there's an emergency. Mm -hmm. And so um, in, in some ways, uh, the fire department and the police are the first responders, but we're right. there to help too. And so it could be a board up for a fire just to make sure the place is safe. Mm -hmm. And then we do mitigation and we can actually do the repairs too. And so um, Trying to, you know, Surpro's tagline is like it never even happened, trying to get it back to like it was before. Okay. And um, I have very good texts that help me to do that. So I, I know living in Tidewater with the humidity and such, I guess that uh, things like mold and things are also, that's also an issue with homes, isn't it? Mold is one of our um, largest uh, um, mitigation areas in, uh, in an area as wet as Tidewater, mm -hmm. if you have poor drainage or an area that gets water and, and poor circulation, it's easy to get mold, and um, uh, all of our techs are um, um, mold certified. There's a that national organization that does that, and uh, we can help a lot of people. And so in many cases, we can just say how they can get rid of it so yeah. that it's no cost at all. Well, what would somebody we'll look for? I mean, because you have a fire, that's sort of an, an emergency flooding and such, but mold. <laughs> a lot of times people will smell it. Uh -huh. And you've all walked into a room where you can just get that smell. Like is there a rotten egg somewhere? Um, <laughs> it, you, can, you can smell it and that means that um, those are byproducts of wind molds growing. Mm -hmm. That's what that smell is. And in many cases you see it. Mm -hmm. And you know, people are afraid of different types of mold. Again, one phone call, that's, that's free. Uh, we'll come out, we'll look at it, and, okay. and it may be something they can take care of or we're happy to help. Okay. Now, uh, taking care of private homes, I guess all sorts of buildings, are there any other sorts of structures you know, that, that it's, you deal with? What's, what's neat about Portsmouth is the variety of um, businesses and homes and um, uh, government entities around. Uh, we've done work in homes from very small homes, uh, crawl spaces where we found critters living underneath. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I took pictures uh, this week of uh, kittens under a crawl space when we opened it up. And also all the way up to, um, we've helped the Coast Guard and uh, done a, a ship remediation oh, where they really? had okay. a fire on a ship. And um, happy to do it and um, happy to help. Okay, how many do you employ here? 
Uh, we have a dozen techs mm -hmm. and a project manager and a marketing person. So there's about 16, 17 of us total. Okay, now I'm looking around the room here and this is like a showroom. There's like tons of carpet samples and things like this. So where do these come to play? Um, when things get wet, um, <laughs> a lot of times flooring has to come up. Mm -hmm. And so um, in some cases, people would like the same people who took it up to put it back down. And so as a service to our customers, what we do is try and make it easier on them. And we work with the insurers and uh, in many cases they allow us just to put it back and it saves time and mm -hmm. in a lot of cases just makes it easier on the customer. Okay, do you do, do, you do carpet or is it, do you do woodwork or? Um, what? We're a class A contractor okay. so we can what do, does that mean exactly? class A is in the state of Virginia we can do anything pretty much out there and so we don't build houses or anything like that but Pretty much anything that we have to tear out, we can put back. Okay. Um, and we have our own crews that do that. And so um, we keep control of the process and that's always a healthy thing. So how fast uh, do you respond? Uh, we have a commitment to um, our insurers that we respond within one hour. Okay. And then we have people on site and we actually will give a report back in the first 24 hours. And so 24 seven, I always have people on call. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, right now, after hours, I'm on call. So if there's a call come in, you end up talking to the owner. Why not? Just as we were setting up the cameras to shoot this interview, you had we, a, a we call had a we in. had an emergency call. It's during working hours, so it came into the number. But that number mm -hmm. is always answered. Okay. And so if it comes in after hours, what happens is the um, project manager on call is paged, and that's me this week. Mm -hmm. And then um, we ha always have two crews on call. Wow. And so no matter when, because it's kind of like having babies. You never know when they're going to come. Um, yeah. A water damage or a fire could happen any time, day or night, mm -hmm. um, any day of the week. Wow. And so we're prepared for whenever. Now, who's your biggest customer around here? Um, we're we're very pleased. Uh, we do business with several of the government mm -hmm. um, uh, entities. Uh, you know, Portsmouth has. Uh, the shipyard, they've mm -hmm. got the Coast Guard, they've got uh, uh, the city and the schools, and we're fortunate to do work for um, people like them and also for many of the insurers. USAA has a very large presence mm -hmm. locally and um, we do work for their members and also um, State Farm. Uh, we have good relationships with the local agencies mm -hmm. and um, pleased to help however we can. That's great. So uh, now Serve Pro, um, what is the history behind Serve Pro itself? It's not just a local, we have the local business here, Serve Pro Portsmouth. But well, the, it's... The, the local one is most important. <laughs> right, exactly. Because that's Portsmouth, and um, that started in 2006. Mm -hmm. And we've been at this location, which is at Airline in um, Greenwood, uh, for the last two years. And Serve Pro itself started in the 60s mm -hmm. and started in California and has over 1,500 franchises nationwide. And so you get the power of the national brand. You see that on TV right. like it never happened. <laughs> but then with very much a local presence. I mean, I live in Portsmouth. I work in Portsmouth. My employees do the same. And so you'll see us at the grocery store kind of thing. <laughs> and so national presence, but very Small much local. town feel. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. All right. Uh, well, thank you for joining us today, uh, telling us about the business. And uh, best of luck with everything. We appreciate you taking time out of your schedule. Thank you Talk for having us. me. All right. Next on Portsmouth Insights, we'll pay a visit to Portsmouth's new fire chief. So, stay tuned. Same time next week? Well, of course. Put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig.
It's easy to tell if you've had way too many. But what if you've had just one too many? Buzz driving is trunk driving. Welcome back to Portsmouth Insights. Late last year, Becky Barfield III was installed as Portsmouth's new fire chief. Chief Barfield began his career as a firefighter back in 1975. Recently, he took time from his busy schedule to welcome our cameras into his office and to discuss his past career, as well as the work and the mission of Portsmouth Fire, Rescue and Emergency Services. Thanks for joining us. Sure. So uh, tell me, when uh, did you decide to become a firefighter? Was this something that you dreamed of as, as, a, as a kid? Is this something you came to a little bit later? I think it's something I, uh, I think I was about six years old <laughs> and I saw a fire in the um, Effingham Street area. And I was just fascinated by the fire truck, which was uh, during that time was Ladder One. Mm -hmm. And uh, from that day, I said, I, I would like to do a job like that. Uh, oh. And that's where I got this, the idea that I wanted to be a firefighter. <laughs> okay. So what did that involve? I mean, how old were you when you finally went into it? I went into the fire service at the age of 25, mm -hmm. um, which was 1975 when mm -hmm. I went in. And it started off as a, uh, as a cadet. Mm -hmm. And I was, um, they had a program through the CEDAR program. Mm -hmm. And they had, had firefighters there. So I applied for that position and I was accepted. And I did that for almost two years in the city of Portsmouth. And uh, after that two year period, I, was, uh, I took the test and came on as a firefighter. Mm -hmm. And I've been there since, uh, since then. Wow. So as a, your perceptions as a, as a child, I suppose, were a bit different from the reality. Yeah. <laughs> um, during that time, the excitement of seeing the, the engines and the sounds and the water and all that, that was uh, fascinated me as a, as a child. Mm -hmm. Once, you know, once you really get into the actual uh, things that go on in a fire station, in a fire, mm -hmm. different situations, then it changes a little bit. Yeah. But, what, what, is, what is, in your estimation, what is the public perception of firefighting? Is, is it different from the reality, or are there common misperceptions people have about firefighters? There are some uh, misperceptions, um, but uh, we, it's, it's a dangerous job, for one thing. There's yeah. a lot of danger involved in it. Each time you go into a burning building, you risk losing your life. Right. Um, but there's a reward for saving someone's life. Mm -hmm. um, I think the biggest reward when you you go in and this people are having their worst day, mm -hmm. you're there to try to help bring some kind of light, make it easier for them to uh, to deal with that that particular time that yeah. they're having the worst day. You know, we live in a very cynical age. I know, as far as politicians, the military, police, I read a uh, year or so ago a survey, and a lot of Americans have sort of a their favorable rating of various authority figures mm -hmm. in society uh, are, are pretty low, but when it comes to firefighters, it's way up there. I mean, the public really tends to idolize. Right. I think the last time they took uh, rating, it was like ninety-eight percent. Yeah. I mean, that's um, unbelievable in this yeah, day and age. <laughs> but you know, if uh, if you have a problem, the first place you call is the fire department. If you don't yep. know anybody else to call. Usually we get the call, and it's some unusual things that happen. We've so, what are calls. some unusual calls? That well, you we, got? <laughs> the most unusual call I had was uh, we went to um, a young man that had gotten married. Mm -hmm. and he was at a bachelor's party, <laughs> and he had handcuffs on, and he had to be to catch a flight, and um, he was unable to catch the flight <laughs> unless somebody released him from those handcuffs. So, <laughs> so bachelor um, party gone yeah, wrong. Yeah, gone, gone wrong. Um, we we gotten cats out of trees and mm. there are so many different different uh, incidents that we respond to. Wow. So when did you, be, you recently have been appointed the chief? Uh, October 15th mm -hmm. of um, 2012 I was appointed uh, fire chief. Um, I, had re I was retired. I retired for nine months mm -hmm. and uh, was asked to come back so I came back and uh, tried to move things forward in this department. Uh, after being here over 35 years mm -hmm. uh, to get a chance to come back, um, I did. Well, great. So, uh, what are some uh, things that people can do uh, to prevent fires in their in their homes? I mean, we, are, are there common things that you keep running across throughout your career that yeah. people would just not do this? This and, would and not have happened. One of the things that I, I I stress to folk, and I talk to kids all the time: don't use candles mm -hmm. in the in the bedrooms. 
those type things, when you, you know, light a candle, that's the leading cause of fires in the bedrooms of candles. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times when the power goes out, mm -hmm. folks go to a candle. It's better to use a flashlight. There's mm -hmm. plenty of flashlights, uh, different kind of lights on the market nowadays that you yeah. can use temporarily to and the power comes back on. I guess beds being highly flammable, flammable mattresses. Yeah. Any kind of any kind of open flames in a house mm -hmm. um, is not I, I really don't like open flames. <laughs> in a, in, especially you, in, a, in a closed environment. Yes. Fire, mm -hmm. fire, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, is the department involved in uh, any charitable work? Um, yeah, any we. Any costs um, that you all support? Let's see. Right now, we're doing fill the boot. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the uh, projects. That and this we is do. when you're out at a stoplight and you see the. Uh, well, the fire we, we, what we do to to keep us safe, we uh, target the uh, supermarkets that allow us to go in, uh -huh. and um, we set up there and and we just hold our boot. If somebody <laughs> wants to donate, they can. If not, you know, we say have a nice day. Mm -hmm. So. And also, we, we partnered with the police department to do a blood drive. Mm -hmm. um, we recently came through the Relay for Life, where we um, assisted with raising money for that, uh, that particular uh, event, and uh, among other things. Yeah. You know. So, as chief, what is the future of the department looking like at this point? Well, what, we're, in a, we're in a process now where we, we've lost a lot of folks because of retirements, mm -hmm. and we're trying to uh, uh, bring our numbers back up, uh, trying to, to uh, we're, we're going to promote some folks and we're going to bring some more new people in. Mm -hmm. And when you bring new people in, you have to train them. Mm -hmm. um, and m one of the first things I did when I came back, I established our training department um, with some people that are very good as, as far as training and mm -hmm. putting that project and uh, putting it together. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to get enough folks, um, new people in, get them trained, and get them on the streets. That's what we're looking so, for. Well, now. what if there's an 18, 19, 20 year old watching this, and they are, they really don't know what they're going to do with life. And, and just in watching this interview, they think maybe that would be a, a career for me. And it is. This, would, this they, is. Should they contact you? I mean, should they contact the department? Well, we we, uh, we, into we, uh, we advertise uh, on the uh, web mm -hmm. uh, through the city of Portsmouth, and we give a test. We give uh, a civil service test, mm -hmm. but we only give it every two years. Okay. I, was saying, I think recently we gave a test in March mm -hmm. and we were working from that list of folk now uh, to offer them positions uh, in the fire service. Okay, so just so. keep their eyes open for... Right. Their, we'll advertise for about a month okay. and um, they'll be able to uh, get an application and apply. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Sure. It's great sure. to learn more about something that we all take for granted but right. you right. know, very much rely on. Okay. Thanks for joining us. Sure. More Portsmouth Insights is coming up, so stay tuned. Read to a child today and spark a lifetime of ambition. Welcome back to Portsmouth Insights. The area we now call Hampton Road saw tremendous growth during World War II when citizens from all over the country moved here to work in shipbuilding, the military, and defense industries. During those years, neighborhoods were built throughout the region to provide affordable homes to those families. Now, directly across the street from Portsmouth City Park in the Olive Branch Cemetery, one of those neighborhoods was built in the early 1940s. 
That neighborhood is Simonsdale. My name is Heather Harkle Road. I've lived in Simonsdale since 2004. Mm -hmm. I'm president of the Civic League, um, Simonsdale Civic Club. My name is Mickey Bremus. I lived in Simonsdale when I was a little girl. I, I moved there when I was three years old and left there when I was about 10. I'm Rob and I lived in Simonsdale from the time I was born until I was 12 years old. Before my parents moved to Simonsdale, they lived over in Waterview Apartments. Uh, my dad was working at the shipyard and going to school in the evenings at ODU. My mother worked for the city in the finance department. And when they found out they were going to have me, they realized their little apartment wasn't going to be big enough. And so they moved to Simonsdale and bought a little house on the corner of Maurice Street and Van Patten Place. A Van Patten Place, uh, probably the shortest street in the neighborhood, only four houses on it. Some of my earliest memories of Simonsdale is uh, um, when we first moved into the neighborhood, I was just a little girl. I'm a twin, I'm an identical twin. And so that was kind of fun, but um, I was one that always wanted to meet new people, and and so I saw another little girl down the street, about the same size as me, and so I went over and introduced myself and got to know her. Her name was Allison, and uh, she had a sister Janet that was two years older, and so my twin sister hung out with her her sister, and we just were together the whole time I lived there. The neighborhood is filled with kids. Um... This is the baby boom generation, so it seemed the kids were everywhere, and everyone knew everyone, not just the people living around you, but you know, kids from four, five, six blocks away. There were kids everywhere. You're right, it was just everybody everywhere. <laughs> you had a big crab apple tree in her side yard. My dad built my brother's side a little fort in it, uh, hung tire swings there that were very popular with the kids in the neighborhood. I remember one of the things we used to do, at night we would play hide and seek after dinner. And everybody went home for dinners, and then we'd come out and we'd play hide and seek until it got dark. And it was like the whole neighborhood. Everybody was running around everybody's yards hiding and counting, and, and just, it was so much fun. I just loved it. And the, you know, the parents would sit out on the screen porch and, and chat while the kids were out playing. City Park, of course, was just a few blocks away. And so on summer nights after dinner, um, my dad would pack me and my brothers in the car, and we'd go off to City Park and play there until sunset. But that was uh, one of the memories of, of growing up in Simonsdale. We went to City Park pretty often. We would walk down there and go feed the ducks. We'd take bread with us and feed them and, and just hang out at the park. It was just a lot of fun. We like riding bikes and walking. Um, we go up there and feed the ducks, and it's, it's the boats, the beautiful sunsets. You kind of put down things and you go, you go do that and you come back to them and that's the nice part of living that close to the city park and it's maintained beautifully. Um, the golf course, that's one of my goals, <laughs> it's just to get out there and maybe enjoy that one time. But um, it, it's great. I love city park, I love Simonsdale. One of the landmarks in the neighborhood was a tiny little store across from uh, Simonsdale Presbyterian called Dinkers. It was just a one room shack with shingles on the outside. Uh, but it had an actual old-fashioned candy counter. I mean, it looked like something from 100 years ago. I remember the store at the end of the street. It was, it was right at the end of our street. We went almost every day. They sold, you know, the five and 10 cent candy bars, the standard stuff, but they also literally sold penny candy. And so on summer days, uh, my mom, my little brother and I, uh, a couple of pennies or a nickel a piece, and we'd go to Dinker's and get this uh, penny candy. Back then, you used to be able to um, take um, soda bottles and cash them in for a nickel or something like that. And so we would gather up all the bottles we could find and take them down to the store because we didn't have any money and uh, cash them in for money and we'd go get our penny candy. And you could get two for a penny, so it was a real bargain. And I'd get like little candy lipsticks and wax lips and stuff like that. And it was just, just a fun thing. We used to do it every day. There was a strip of uh, shops across from Dinkers that uh, had been built probably in the 1940s when the neighborhood was built. And there were a couple of stores in, the, in there as well. So you had a little center to the neighborhood back then. There was Simon's L. Presbyterian, Dinkers, these shops. And then there was Brown's Barbershop. Again, a little one-room shop. You walked up these wooden steps into the little one-room barbershop. The building is still there. It's no longer Brown's, I think it's, but I think it's still a beauty salon of some sort. But there was a real sense of community, and you had that little town center in the middle of uh, Simonsdale. But a block behind us was uh, Sycamore Farm, a beautiful old plantation house built in 1822. I just remember this this large mansion 
Um, it was so different from all the other houses in the neighborhood. What I was always told was that that was the original plantation house for a plantation that had been in that area in the 1800s, and that Simonsdale was built on what had once been that plantation. But at Halloween, they would they would have all this candy laid out, and they'd let you come in their house and, and pick out from the bowls that they had set out. And no one else did that in the neighborhood. So we just thought, wow, because you could take as much as you wanted. They didn't care, you know? <laughs> It was, I just remember being really excited about going to the mansion. It was like a big deal. Wow. So. The school we all went to was Simonsdale Elementary. Uh, a lot of kids in that part of the city went there. Uh, if you lived in Simonsdale, you, there were no buses. You had to walk. And it was about a mile away. So it really was a, a good bit of a track. I had older brothers and sisters, and so we walked with them to school that day. They had um, the crossing guard that would help you across the street. I remember that. There's a new elementary school there now, and it's beautiful. There's a beautiful school, state-of-the-art, green, right right behind where it was located across from the cemetery in City Park. Uh, my daughter attend, was the first year to attend there. She graduated sixth grade there, first year. It's beautiful, and it's changed the neighborhood in that area where it's it was getting darker and gloomier. Now it's um, got the new lights and the baseball fields and, and the school really brings some um, the kids back into the back part of that neighborhood that was kind of getting a little bit quiet. I have a lot of fond memories of, of Simonsdale and uh, it was a great place to, to grow up in. And I'm excited by uh, the way the uh, Civic League there is really trying to engender a lot of uh, excitement and renewing the neighborhood and uh, you know, restoring it to the, to the way it was. The Civic League isn't just there for problems. Um, we're there to let you know what resources we have, and if we can come as you know a body of ten versus one voice, then we'll be able to get the the funding that the city has in for us. And it's the louder voice that gets that gets the work done, really. So that's what I'm here to to just try to bring people together with socials and events, and then give them information about the city and when to vote. You know, of course we promote when to vote and using your rights to vote because that's that's where our leaders come in and that's who we're going to follow and, and direct and, and try to get some political people in there too because that's, that's important. If you're a resident of Simonsdale, um, we hold our meetings every, the first Monday of every month regardless of holidays. There'll be newsletters coming out quarterly. We have a site on the city's website for the civic clubs. So just look up Simonsdale, all the information's there. But we also have a Facebook page that we update for coming up events and meeting reminders. So if you want to get on that tag, you're welcome to join our Facebook at Simonsdale Civic Club on Facebook. Gearing up uh, for fall and the next year to have a few CERT classes with the fire department. Um, that certified emergency response team that they will come and train individuals in our community. So when we have a, an emergency, those those team members can act fast and, and, and Simonsdale Civic Club will be an, an emergency response hub for that team. It's a great community, I love it. Um, if you get a chance to come through, you definitely drive through it going to City Park. If you have any thoughts or comments, please share it with me. And um, if you're a resident, please join and become a member of the Civic Club. That's our show for today. As is our custom here, we asked our guests what they would like you to know about Portsmouth. Let's hear what they had to say. I took a Lefko leadership class um, 10 years ago, uh, at Van H. Lefko. They hold it with Portsmouth Partnership, and it opened my eye to the history and richness of this city. Well, there you have it. But don't take their word for it. Come to Portsmouth. See what all the talk is about. I'm Rob Lauer. Join me next time for another episode of Portsmouth Insights.